Okay, I'm going to talk about the graphic movie poster assignment. Really cool assignment, in my opinion, and I didn't even make it up. Actually, it's a kind of a standard assignment for designers. Um, ever since Saul Bass, you will learn about him in Historical Survey Part B, if we haven't, you haven't already taken it, uh, a designer in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and he was a master of movie posters, um, starting from the 50s, but going on. Some of his most famous ones here, you can see Anatomy of a Murder, West Side Story, The Man with the Golden Arm, a bunch of other ones if you Google him. And he also did the titles to go, he would do like a whole identity for the movie. So it would include logo, poster, packaging, if they were you know, gonna be released, and movie titles. Um, and he was known for these very graphic representations of complex plots. And his, he goes in and out of style as a huge influencer in design and in the design of both movie posters and titles. So nowadays, I think we're more, more used to seeing this sort of slick Hollywood posters around. There's plenty of them out there that use heroic photos of the um, actors or maybe very photorealistic illustrations of the actors. Sometimes I hear it's hard to get all of the actors together for a photo shoot, you can kind of tell in this Avengers image that it's been like stripped together from different individual shots and then and then re-illustrated. Um, an amazing photograph at the bottom from of Joaquin Phoenix from Joker. It's a great poster, uh, but it's just kind of straightforward. It shows the, the character in character as, you know, in the movie. Nothing really mysterious or magical about it. They do work to sell movie tickets, with the big stars especially, but they don't necessarily have strong creative concepts. What we're talking about are more pieces of illustration or graphic design, um, graphic movie posters. And the good thing about these is there's a bunch of reasons that sometimes movie companies still, production companies still do this. One is that if they haven't decided on the star yet or they haven't you know figured out exactly the marketing strategy they might just want to pr promote the movie purely on the basis of the plot or the story and not commit to a character they also don't have to pay the person to use their image in the advertising they also maybe they have two different versions that are in different languages or something and these images speak to people in different countries um also for like a, a broadway show they do this oftentimes because the cast changes so they don't necessarily commit to a whole big photo shoot of the cast or something they, they might do a more graphic representation so and the fun thing as a viewer or a collector of these posters is that there's this nice little thing that happens in your brain where you're sort of like putting two pieces of a puzzle together um, this is an image that was actually made by Chip Kidd. You might have heard him speak or seen him. He's from Reading, Pennsylvania, oddly enough. And he famously designed this image for the book cover of uh, the original book. And then they used it for the movie. They sold the rights to the book, which included the rights to the cover, and used it for the movie. And he didn't even know about it until the, after the movie was already underway. So he didn't get paid anything extra, which is a little bit of a jip. I think he was recognized later. But... Um, and his story about making this image is that he actually, I think, went to like the Museum of Natural History and looked at dinosaur bones to get inspiration. And he quickly sketched the outline. He did like a, um, what is it where you don't look at the paper? Uh, uh, um, oh, you know what I'm saying. When you just look at the object of your drawing and don't look down at the paper. So he did a quick sketch of the dinosaur skeleton in the Museum of Natural History and then went home and that made the perfect um, book cover. So really the, the only juxtaposition that's going on here is that the dinosaur is juxtaposed with that little scene underneath that makes you know he's not in a museum, he's out in the wild, the skeleton. So there's like a little hint that the dinosaur is alive, right? Um, and these posters work like visual riddles that leave us smiling. It's like a, it's a riddle, but it's an easy riddle. I'm gonna show you a, a ton now of professional examples of this and I want you to notice that in each one of these posters they're combining symbols so some of them are more realistic symbols like the symbol in the middle of a pirate ship um, so there's a skull and a pirate ship and a crowd of people 
in the Goonies. And actually, I would say, I would argue that the type is also has become a symbol. It looks like, you know, skeleton teeth, the word Goonies. So that's at least one, two, three, four different symbols combined into one element. Here we're combining the symbol, the silhouette of Clint Eastwood, very distinctive eyebrow um, and mouth kind of. He's got that like really flat mouth with the silhouette of a gun. So again, we have two things, two symbols that are combined to make a third thing. The meaning is greater than the sum of its parts. Here we have three symbols, basically. Stairway, guy running up the stairs, and then the heroic rocky pose that's flipped upside down. Here, two symbols. It takes a minute to see it. If you've ever seen this movie, super scary and great movie, there will be blood. We've got the symbol of a oil well pump and a cross. Here, famous um, uh, optical illusion trick where you have two faces that make up the side of a glass. But this is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And we have, I guess that's Steven Spielberg. <laughs> And think about it. Anyway, we have Indy on the left, Harrison Ford, and I think it's Steven Spielberg on the right, making up some kind of holy chalice relic. Here, more, again, a more realistic image. It's a photograph and not an illustration, but we still are combining the image of cords and um, cable cords into the stripes of the convict um, or concentration camp. Um, uniform. Here, super simple, birds and hair, gun and Eiffel Tower. You see what I'm saying? Two things, one plus one. My professor from, from my undergrad school used to call this one plus one equals three. I didn't really understand what they meant, but that means one symbol plus another symbol equals something that is not just two symbols. It is not just a picture of a gun and a picture of a and Eiffel Tower, it has combined into a third thing, the symbol for the movie. We call this in the, at KUCD, that we call this colloquially, the spork assignment. You see what I'm saying? We got a taxi plus a gun. Taxi plus a gun is a taxi gun. It's a spork of a symbol. Apple and snake and Eve, space. Temptation. Actually, it's not evil. Uh, it's not Eve. I don't know. It's the character. It's the Tyler Perry character. But this is a great one. If you've seen this movie, the guy gets stuck between these two cracks in a rock, and something happens to his hand. That's not very nice. So this nicely in incorporates both those elements. Negative space. So when you're working on this, you're going to be thinking about positive space and negative space. Of course, I like this one very much. Slice of an orange eyelid. So this is, you know, to diagnose it step by step. These are easy to look at and you're like, oh, fun. That seems easy. Not so easy to do. These posters are often highly collectible. There's a lot of uh, designers that just use them on their website. There's actually competitions to do these sometimes. Um, they make great, uh, they make great competition entries. It's a great technique for further down the line. If you have an assignment, whether it's a packaging assignment or a book cover assignment or an advertising assignment, anytime you can like take two symbols and combine them into a third thing and make a spork, you are going to succeed. Notice in your daily life, how many times images like this are seen around you. Um, and it's really, there is something chemically that happens in the viewer's brain where it's like pleasing to solve this problem, to be like, oh, I get it. Uh, so here we have, you know, two different symbols. Um, and again, this doesn't rely on the faces of the stars. We don't need to see Meryl Streep's or Anne Hathaway's face on this poster. Um, it actually, it's a stronger image, I think, for this particular movie than for any other movie that could have been a combination of the two of them, if you know what I'm saying. So, and when we're thinking about symbols, when you're working on this, you don't have to necessarily use physical objects that are in the movie. When you make your A to Z brainstorming list, you will include those. Like in this, for example, in this movie, there is no devil's pitchfork. She doesn't literally become a devil. She's not like, you know, it's not a, it's not a sci-fi fantasy story. She's just a devilish person. So the concept is, 
what is the devil? I mean, the devil is in the headlines, right? But I mean, in the title of the movie, but, um, but it's more abstract. It's a more abstract version of a devil. She's just an evil person. So when you're thinking about visuals, you don't necessarily just need to stick to the visuals that are actually in the movie. You can also think about concepts that are, that relate to the genre, like, you know, comedy tragedy. There's those comedy tragedy masks that you might've seen for their theatrical symbols or the symbol of a dagger. Maybe the person's not, well, I guess, you wouldn't want to use a dagger if there wasn't a dagger in the movie. But you know what I'm saying. Like a mystery might have a magnifying glass, even if the even if the uh, detective in the mystery is not literally looking at things through a magnifying glass. So there's a little bit of leeway for symbolism. So just to diagnose it further, we call this the spork assignment because you're using to make your compelling image. You're going to combine two or more, if you want to get really fancy, images to create a visual synergy that's greater than either of the images alone. So it's one of those things where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. A fork plus a spoon is a spork, or one plus one equals three. In the example I just showed you, to break it down, obviously someone was thinking and sketching and drawing what represents high fashion, high-heeled shoes. In it's, you know, set in the office of theoretically Vogue magazine. So high fashion, Ladies wear high fashion shoes. And then a pitchfork represents the devil. So does a pointy tail. They probably had a version with a pointy tail in it. But they combined those two things that sort of sync up visually very nicely, the skinny, spiky, sword-like stiletto of the, of, the, of the stiletto heel plus the pitchfork make this new symbol. Looks easy, easy to look at, not easy to make. That's why we have you go through this list. As you're watching the film, you can do it before, during, and after. But as you're watching the movie, this person just did it with an A to Z list on a piece of paper. You can print out the A to Z list that we included in the assignment. You can you know, make a grid on in your sketchbook of 26 spaces and drew little doodles in them. But, um, you can see this person's theme was Alice in Wonderland or the movie, and they did all kinds of um, brainstorming about, you know, forest, flowers, giants, the hatters, an iguana, the jabberwocky, the knave of hearts, a locked door, the march hare, oysters, the potion, the queen, the red queen, the rabbit hole, and etc. And if you if there's a if you can't think of something for you know Z or Q or K don't stress. And again, you're looking for the literal things, but also symbolic things. And then to the next stage, after you do that, you're going to be, sometimes uh, it's easy to just brainstorm little sketches of all the things and look at the shapes of them. So if you want to draw, you know, Cheshire cats, if you want to think about how that works, um, there could be an in-between step where you just sketch shapes, but this is the step where this student, this is from 2019, has gone ahead and, you know, I think a really good set, actually, of thumbnails. There's, there's more than one good idea in here, um, but the one that we sort of centered on was this idea of Alice's dress as an upside-down teacup, especially when she's falling, like the idea of the dress ballooning out like a teacup um, is kind of cool. Uh, so once you have that, if you stumble across that magical combination of visuals, it's like, ta-da, oh my God, I got it. That's it. It's like a, a big moment. Um, and while you're doing this, you want to think about the negative shapes too. Is there anything that could go between the teeth of the Cheshire cat or, you know, between the inside of the handle of the teacup? So think about the positive space, but also the gaps. There's a, there's a visual in here that has keyhole that becomes something else. Um, and you'll see how she's used visual space in the real final poster. So this is the same student's final image. And she actually liked so many of her ideas. And so did I, that we picked a bunch of them. So the main one you could see was this tumbling Alice teacup, um, kind of fun. So originally she had her right side up. So the teacup was upside down, but then with the addition of having her fall down the rabbit hole, 
she's upside down. So there's some interesting scale things too, and the way that she has played with color, the, the artist, the student, help, uh, helps to organize the design. We're calling out Alice with her bright colored blue and yellow and pink and white, so she stands out from the more neutral, darker background. Then you can see how the, the March Hare and the Mad Hatter have been uh, reduced to forms that blend into the sides of the rabbit hole. Um, there's a little teapot just to kind of call that. I don't, I don't actually think that's necessary. I feel like she stuck that in there at the end. And then these little bits of like snow or dust or whatever is happening, falling are made, um, are the, the card suits from the deck of cards. So a lot of things are going on. It's just really fun to look at and fun to discover the kind of the more you look, the more you see. Um, but her basic initial combination was Alice's dress plus a teacup. So that's what I'm hoping you can stumble upon yourself. And the first step is to watch the movie and use your A to Z brainstorming list. That's all that's due for this week.